Yo, 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 you already know what time it is. Welcome back to another episode of Thinker versus Speaker, where I, Marissa the Thinker, sit down with different guests and we talk about all things, anything, everything, life, love, relationships, spirituality, literally whatever we want to talk about. So if you're into that type of thing, strap up, tune in, and get ready to talk to us. On that note, because we talk about any and everything, sometimes we talk about sensitive subjects. I don't think we will today, but sometimes we do. So take it as a general trigger warning. If we get into something that you don't want to hear, you know, do what you got to do. We respect it. But hopefully you come back next week because we talk about all types of things here. You know what I'm saying? So on that note, we're going to go ahead and get started. This week, we have a special guest new to the show. I'm very excited to speak with you today. We have Dr. Precious Hardy, educational psychologist. How are you today? I am well. I am well. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yes, 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 yes. I am super excited, super excited to have you. Um, we actually met through a common link with Trey, who actually was on one of our last episodes. I think there's an episode between this one and his, but yeah, the common link of Trey, you know what I'm saying? The Emerging Business Leaders Expo. You are one of those board members. Yes. Yeah. Yes. 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 So tell us a little bit about yourself. So um, just to tell you a little, you know, you guys a little bit about me. I am from, because I love telling people where I'm from. Of course, I'm, of course. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> I'm from East St. Louis, Illinois. Uh, and, you know, one of the reasons why I tell people that is because you know, when you come from an impoverished city, a small impoverished city like that, you know, where it's a crime-ridden environment, you know, things do happen. Um, but people don't expect you to be successful. Um, you, you know, people kind of write this narrative or form this narrative about you, and then they just expect you to fall in line with whatever that may be, right? Um, so oftentimes in East St. Louis, it's the whole narrative like, you know, you're going to be a baby mama, probably at 23, you know, you're going to be, I mean, seriously, I, don't, I hope I hope that's not offensive to anyone. Um, but I just say that to say that people try to define you when you come from places like that. And you can't define me. I will not be defined. And so that's one of the reasons why I always tell people the very first thing, I'm from East St. Louis, Illinois. So, yeah. Um, you know, what else do you want to know about me? Uh well, you, I'm all, I already got a tangent that I want to go down real quick because I find it so interesting. I didn't actually know that you were from East St. Louis, right? Yes, yes. So the so the St. Louis in part of the St. Louis in me is just like East St. Louis. Yeah, okay, you know what I'm saying? Because <laughs> you know how we are. You know how exactly. We are. <laughs> you know what's so funny though? What is so funny is there's oftentimes because I, I've been in rooms. You know, I've been in rooms where I was the only black girl in the room, and mm -hmm. and it'll be men, usually white men, telling me you know, you should tell people you're from St. Louis because actually East St. Louis has a better rep than East St. Louis. And I'm like, you clearly missed it. You know, you missed the point, <laughs> yeah. you know, like you miss how impactful it is for those kids. One, I'm not going to do that. Number one, <laughs> number two, I, no, no shade, you know, you, you from St. Louis, woo -woo. Uh, but number two, it's like, it's important for the kids from that from that community, from the impoverished community, from my community, to see people that look like them, that been through the streets that they've been through, went through this, like went through all that, to see them make. It. Like it's so important for them, and I don't think when you come from like such a small city like East St. Louis, the people that make it, that make it, quote unquote, you know, a lot of them don't come back to the city, right? They go on, they move to you know the suburbs. <laughs> some, some people move out of state. Um, but there is some of us that stay and there is some of us that come back to give back. And, and even, if, even if that's just representation, Hey, you see me, I'm here, I'm in your community. I'm in the grocery store with you. Um, so that's important for them to be able for them, those students, those kids, people in the community to see that. Yeah, I absolutely, I absolutely agree with what it is that you say. And I love that you are proud of where you come from. You know what I'm saying? Of course I say it in a joking manner because that's just how we are but and you we know, know how it is we we know what's up <laughs> yeah we know how it is but I mean honestly it is it's important because I mean even a part of the reason why we do this show right is to show that we can come from where we come from yeah, yeah. and you know what I'm saying it is is more representation out there than what we see you know what I'm saying Absolutely. um and I find it funny because there there was an episode that I did with my dad and we talked about St. Louis. Um, it was called Special St. Paul. 
where Ashton and I were talking about uh, St. Louis, and he was actually talking about how at one point in time, East St. Louis was an up and coming, up and coming city. That's true. And I was like, huh? And he was like, he literally said, you better believe it because they were building that up to be something great. And the reason why I couldn't comprehend it is because I see what it is now, you know, and what, and what has been for the majority of my life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you don't mind, like going that way with, uh, with me a little bit, can we explain to the audience what it's like in East St. Louis, you know, we're alluding to it, but let's actually talk about it for a second. Yeah, for sure. So we can talk about that. And before we talk about that, I want to go back and just comment on what you, what you're saying. That's absolutely true. I mean, one of the reasons why, how my mom even got to East St. Louis was because, uh, it was an up and coming city. And a lot of blacks from the South started migrating to the to the East St. Louis and St. Louis because they could get jobs. You know, there was job opportunities there. And what actually ended up happening, because a lot of industries was there. I mean, a lot. Um, and what actually ended up happening was, I don't know if you're familiar with the 1917 race riot that happened in East St. Louis. Um, but a I've lot of whites, it. yeah, a lot of whites were becoming upset because here you have all these black people coming from you know, coming from the South and they're getting the jobs because they may take a smaller pay, you know, than you would. And it's like, well, hold up, hold up. Cause uh, where the jobs are for us. So we gotta, we gotta do something about this. And then, I mean, a, a lot of people, uh, like relative to, to that time period, a lot of people die in those riots. A lot of black people died in those riots. And Marcus, Car- Marcus Garvey actually came out and he did, um, he did some kind of, I know he, I don't want to call it a protest. It wasn't really a protest, um, but he had an event in St. Louis where he kind of brought the news and the media out um, and he brought up some of this stuff. He talked about this and just called it like, you know, one of the saddest days in America because it was just like, wow, you know, and and we see that everywhere, you know, that's not unique to East St. Louis. You know, we saw it in Tulsa, we saw it in, you know, all these other different places where it happened. So that's kind of how, you know, the race riots happened. And then you slowly start seeing the industries move out of move out of East St. Louis, taking all the jobs. Like, oh, okay, we can't kill you off. We just gonna move all the jobs out of the city. Um, and now, Marissa, Marissa, it's like it's been so long. Like we talking about decades, and the city still has not recovered. The the city still has not recovered from that. the the average The average like annual salary in East St. Louis is just over twenty one thousand dollars. Whoa, twenty one thousand. That's that's it. So you can you can imagine, and we're talking about you know, you know, just a whole host of issues, not only just pertaining to like the safety of the community, because what does it mean when you don't have you know, place you know you don't have ways to kind of implement you know taxes or fees or things like that that would actually garnish cities cities money because this is how the cities get their money and what does that mean for the police department what does that mean for the streets what does that mean for the education system like what does that mean and so while it's it's very you know there there's people in the city that want to see it change and that that's working toward this change and it is becoming better you know we do have a lot of things that's going on Jackie Jordan Cursa when she won the Olympics and her money you know she started the Jackie Jordan Cursa Center in East St. Louis and they're doing great work they're still to this day doing great work I'm actually working on some programs with them over there um, teaching kids how to grow their own food and be sustainable which is very important and let me tell you why because in the city of East St. Louis um most of, well, how many do we have? We probably have two grocery stores, two. Yeah. <laughs> um, and they're owned by individuals that do not live in the community at all, um, that do not reflect the, the members of the community. And so you'll go in the grocery store and right hand, you know, I've been in the grocery store shopping in a grocery store and you'll see food with that's molded. You know, you, you'll pick some off the shelf that's expired. My yeah. mom was so pissed <laughs> maybe like a few weeks ago because <laughs> we was trying to fry some catfish, okay? But um yeah, she bought something and we got to the we got to the house and you know getting ready to use it and she like what this expired. So like there's there's people that is that's trying to shift the culture, that's trying to, you know, shift the way in which people perceive East St. Louis, but actually you know, just trying to build up the community because it is still very much, even though it's been decades, 
since that since the riots, since the industry's moved out, that that happened is still very broken. You know, companies do not want to come there because of you know the narrative of East St. Louis, what it is, and you know, there's a little bit of truth in, in you know, in some things. And so I understand it. I understand the hesitation, but it's only going to perpetuate the problem if no one actually steps in to, to offer some solutions. That's true. That's true. That's true. That's true. And ooh, ooh, I just want to, there's two things that I want to do. One, I want to highlight what you said about the food deserts. And that's interesting because I actually just got done having a conversation. The episode before this one comes out is with a girl named Chanel and she's a, um, she does homesteading. She has like her own garden and right. she's from St. Louis as well. And a lot of what she does is uh, showing people how to grow their own food and be self-sustaining because it's literally what you said, how we live in these food deserts and the food that you have on your shelves is moldy and you you can't eat it or you don't have fresh food fresh produce and access to all of these things it's easy to get a convenience store but you can't get food that actually sustains you and uh she was actually talking about how in north county they're opening a bunch of farmers markets Mm. to get people access to fresh food and she actually uh gave a lot of resources um as far as how people can gain access to fresh foods so if y'all are interested in finding out more, check out that episode. She drops a lot of knowledge about that and that subject, okay. you know, um, because it is important because what we feed ourselves is important. And we come from areas that are food deserts where we don't have the access okay. to the foods and the things that we need. And it's important. And that's why it's important to highlight when we are doing these things to change these narratives and to really give back and get access to the things that it is that we need because we already know we can't expect other people to help us Mm -hmm. we have to be that change Mm -hmm. so um with that being said is that what do you think that where you came from had an influence on what you decided to do as far as what your career is and the type of research that you did oh absolutely absolutely I mean, so I'll say this, right? Even though I was, I mean, I could tell you about myself, maybe offline, <laughs> you probably wouldn't believe some of the stuff I told you. Oh. But despite all that thing, I was an honor student. I was in honor classes and et cetera. Yeah. And so I thought, you know, I'm, I'm a smart kid because I, I wasn't really, I wasn't really aware of like um, how much we didn't have. Right. Like when you grow up, it's not like, oh, it's like I know I'm I mean, I I know I'm looking around and I know, oh, maybe that's broke and it's broke. But I don't know, like I'm in dire poverty, like you're below the poverty line in this particular city because, you know, just the way it runs and, and looking at some of the numbers. Um, So when I got to college. And I, you know, looking around, looking at the curriculum, talking to other people, and I'm just like, what the, what the hell are you talking about? You know, <laughs> I remember when I was in grad school. Uh, one of my professors was saying, "Oh yeah, so um yeah, what where's the inflection point? You guys should have took this, you know, learned this in high school." And I'm like, "Bro, my high school didn't have calculus classes. What are you talking about?" And so it was yeah. when I when I got to college, I realized, like, man, you know, how does my K twelve education really stack up against the rest of the world? You know, I felt like I was cheated, and and I, and I didn't like that feeling at yeah. all, yeah. and. And then it made me feel like, well, all the kids that's that's there now, that's coming behind me, that they're going through the same kind of, you know, through this process. They don't know because once I got into the research, that was one of the reasons why I got into the research because of just feeling like I, I didn't have an adequate education and wanting to be a voice for the voiceless in a sense of those students that was also experiencing that. So I got into educational research, but. I'm gonna give you the full, full story because I can be honest with you. You good energy. Um, so uh I went to Lincoln University and um, you know, first first time in college, real happy, whatever. Got a refund check. Was like, oh my God, you know. Rich now. <laughs> Blew the check. 
<laughs> like blew it when shopping we went to the lake of the ozarks they have like all these outlets when shopping out there was broke by christmas okay by december and i'm like man you know what i'm gonna do like i couldn't i couldn't even afford to go home for christmas i have to call my mom and say hey can you buy me a plane uh, a train ticket and she got me a ticket or whatever so i was broke hit rock bottom in my sense and i'm like you know what man that that that, that can't happen again i can't let that happen again <laughs> so yeah. got got to school the next the next school year end up getting a job as a tutor um end up getting another job in the human resource office again because i was flat broke so it's like man i got a lot to make up for and then i heard about this opportunity to become a research assistant with one of my professors who's my mentor, who's like family right now to this day, I live with her when I was in graduate school in Columbia, Missouri. And um, it was about doing research, educational research. And so that's kind of how I, I already had this idea that I wanted to help, that I wanted to do something based on my own experiences. But that's how I really got my foot in the door to actually do the work was through that research assistant position with her. And I was just like, once I started reading the literature, I'm just like, it kind of pissed me off a little bit because it was like, so y'all know this? So y'all y'all been new this, right? You yeah. know, all this stuff that they say. All the students from low SE, you know, low economic backgrounds or students from these particular type of communities are more likely to, you know, X, Y, and Z. And it's like, you've been doing this for decades and, and where are the solutions? Why, why is that still happening? You haven't done anything. And so that 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 really just kind of made me start doing the work that I felt like could produce solutions. Um, and so yeah, I don't I know I'm about to start ranting. I'm trying not to. <laughs> oh, you're fine. I mean that I mean essentially that's I go on rants all the time. So like if you want to go on a rant, go ahead. Because yeah. it like I I feel you. Yes. I feel you. Because I I said it when we first started interacting, it was something that I was passionate about. Mm -hmm. Now there was a program because I went to I went to S and T, but I I I dropped out mm -hmm. because we 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 can talk about why. Okay, it's the same reason. So there was actually a program. I got a scholarship now, um, and and the scholarship was a diversity scholarship. I had a couple scholarships, but my main one was a diversity scholarship, and one of the stipulations of getting this scholarship is that you had to go to a three-week program before school started where you live on campus and you take classes and that's what's going to dictate dictate your placement in your classes mm -hmm. screw the placement test that you took last march is going off of this right here mm -hmm. and what i will say is that the director of that program was an older a older man and he was black and his his name was Dr. Collier, if I remember correctly. He was our chemistry teacher. And mm -hmm. He was passionate about this, very passionate that we attended this program. And the reason that the and it was called hit the ground running, felt like hit the wall. Mm -hmm. The purpose of this program was for them to essentially break us, break break us. It was to not break us in a bad way but to give us that reality check mm. before we even got to school in the first place mm. because they knew we were going to hit a wall and they wanted to they wanted us to hit that wall before we actually started our classes that were going to affect our GPAs and everything like that so they paired it with like a bunch of like resources. So it's just like, if you already not doing well, cause we would get tested weekly. Like if you're not doing well, you have to go to this uh, workshop. You have to go through this program. You gotta be in a study group, X, Y, Z. And it just showed us like everything that we thought we were, because mm -hmm. you know, when you come from schools, like where we come from, you think you hot shit. You know, I took calculus, but it was only two people, two other people in my high school calculus class. We did not learn calculus. And the reason why we did not learn calculus was because we didn't even have a good algebra break base. Mm -hmm. We didn't even know how to do algebra, but we were in calculus. And those things, if you've never taken calculus, <laughs> you cannot do calculus without algebra. Exactly. 
So our teacher was just like, okay, I got one student that's going to engineering. I love my teacher. I ain't going to shade her, but she was just like, I got one of them that's going to engineering and the other two going to nursing school. Y'all never going to take calculus. And according to your placement test, you got to start over anyway, because I did. I had to go all the way back to intermediate algebra when I started college. Wow. So she's just like, you know, we'll just play games for the rest of the year. I'll get y'all Oh, my God. Oh, my God. And that's the reality of where we come from. You know what I'm saying? And my whole school career, I've been hyped up like I'm the smartest thing walking. And then we hit college. And then we realize, whoa, yes. I don't have no study habits. I'm not used to hard work. I don't know half the stuff that these kids know. I'm actually struggling. I don't even think that I'm as smart as I thought I was. Mm -hmm. And that's why I stopped going. Because Man. I wasn't used to asking for help. I didn't know how to ask for help. I felt dumb and I gave up and that's what happens. I, I hate that so bad. I hate that so bad. That, that makes me feel away. And you know, it's like, I don't know if these people be, you know, the, cause it's like, you always have some good teachers and you have some bad teachers and you have people that's just going to keep it a hundred with you all the time. And it's like, I don't know if they be boxed in by good intentions. Like, I really do have good intentions for you. Or if it's if if it's like you walk into the room, <laughs> you know, yeah. you really truly walk into the room and you think because these kids are who they are, oh, you know, these are the kids in the hood, basically, essentially, uh, where, you know, they probably ain't going to get it anyway. So I'm just going to dumb it down I ain't gonna even teach that or we just um, let let them play on the computer and it's etc and it's like it does a disservice though it's a, it does a disservice to the students it's like what are you doing if, if we if we're seriously saying you know I want to I want to move my community I want to move my people forward and, and I'm in the room well especially for me because all my teachers most of my teachers were black because East St. Louis is predominantly black so it's like if I want to move my people forward seriously then I'm going I'm to equip you with the tools that I know you seriously need. I'm, I'm not going to play games with you. And, and it's so, you know, it's so heartbreaking because for the majority of it all, especially when you look at the literature, that, that's exactly what happened, though. It's like I was reading, the, I was actually reading the paper the other day and um, someone was reporting a conversation that they had. It was a qualitative study. So it was just like words and stuff. And the teacher, the parent rather, was saying, how she had a conversation with the teacher about her kid, her child was getting a C in the class. And, you know, the mom had talked to the teacher and et cetera. And that conversation went went by. And so then the teacher went up to the child and had a conversation about, yeah, I talked to your parent. And, you know, C's, C's for you, that's really good. I'm like, what? She What's said, What? So C's for you is really good. But then, because you know, kids are going to talk. So, but you're telling the other kid, no, you can do better. I know you're better than this and I expect better from you. But then you're going to tell this kid because of that phenotype. Right? Yeah. You know, C's, that's really good for you. And it's like, come on, come on, come on, come on. It's like, what, like I don't get it. I don't get it. My dad I has said this. My dad has said this. And I think he's even said it on the show which is crazy to me because it makes me think so it's not just us mm -hmm. this goes back <laughs> you know what i'm saying this goes wow. even back because he was saying like even when they were in school and my dad went to beaumont he was just like even when they were in school there were groups there were groups it's just like y'all will succeed wow y'all will be all right wow and then we gonna pray for y'all and that's what, and like and that's what you're saying. Where it's just like this this will work for you. Now you you could do better. Wow. But you this is all right. And that even even in my high school experience, I've said this before when I went to Riverview. Hate to say it, but it's true. If you were considered honors, you had a completely different experience than everybody else. Mm -hmm. 
because they separated the, the, the different classes and the freshmen stayed with freshmen and they did what they did. And the sophomores stayed with sophomores, junior seniors stayed with junior seniors, junior seniors. But if you were in honors, okay, now you get to go build in the building. Now you get to, you know what I'm saying, experience the different things. We're going to invest in your classes differently. I remember, I will never forget this. We had our map testing. And for map testing, everybody had to test together. Mm. Right? And we were in the class with the quote unquote regular freshmen. And they were reading out loud a book that we read two quarters ago at home. And it's just like, what? That's ridiculous. Exactly. I was, I'm I'm a freshman sitting here looking at this like, this where y'all at with? That's ridiculous. <laughs> Man, that's crazy. It's it's so crazy because it's like when you really look back, like I, I just wonder what happened, you know, what happened to us. You know, like I'm just about to talk real to you because that's you know, what this is for. It's like what happened to us though? Like when you when you look at like that reconstruction era, and a, and a lot of people had, and, and I'm saying like a lot of people came out of slavery. You know, some a lot of people already has had out of being enslaved rather had all these skills. So it was easy to go to work, it was easy to make money and etc. But they also a lot of them turned to and was supported in formal education. Right. And it was like you didn't play about it because it was a lot, a lot at the time when they was forming schools in the South and in little churches and everything like that. It was like education was seen as a form of liberation. Like yeah. you, if you want to be free, you don't want to be, you know, slave. And I, today I would just say <laughs> some people still a slave, you know, <laughs> in, in a different way. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mentally enslaved in this matrix. And it's like, education still and, and I'm, not, I'm not even necessarily talking about formal formal informal whatever nope. you can pick a yep. book you can teach yourself because a lot of people did back then and even so it's like to, to liberate yourself but something happened and so during the whole reconstruction era even like right up probably until like the early 40s 50s like education was seen as something that was so absolutely valuable and it's like your teachers didn't play that. Like they did not play with you. And I'm gonna teach you what you need to go out here and succeed. Because if you go out here and you look crazy, we look crazy. Yep. But yep. now it's like I'm just trying to get my check. And 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 you know what I mean? It's like what happened? What happened? What happened? What happened? Yeah. When, when you start like bubble living. Like like it's like dang, we gotta be in a struggle to to unite. Like you know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Is that the case? Yeah. It, 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 it's almost like when did our values change so yes. drastically? Yes. You know what I'm saying? Because yes. let's be honest, I, I'm sure you're going to know what I'm saying, where it's just like where you grow up with other kids and it's just like, oh, you talk white. Yes. Oh, you smart. Yes. Oh, you this, you that. Yes. What you going on? Yes. Why, why you why you so, you know what I'm saying? And it's just like, exactly. Like, what? Exactly. Like, like what if there is nothing wrong with mm -hmm. wanting to gain more knowledge in anything you know what mm -hmm. i'm saying because mm -hmm. even in life like i'll i'll be real honest like you can grow you, uh, we're older now you can look around and see who has the critical thinking skills and who doesn't yes, yes for sure 100 percent. and i think that's crazy and that's something people still look at this whole thought of acting white or whatever and it's like it's so crazy to me because it's like there clearly had to be a period of conditioning where, cause come on, I'm a psych major, you know, some people call me a conspiracy, whatever. I, I beg to differ. <laughs> it had to be some period of conditioning because it just doesn't make sense. Like, I mean, no, especially when you think about like the fifties and all that, like all the black orators that was on TV every day. You know what I mean? Speaking the way they speak. Like, look at Malcolm. That's one of my favorite people ever. Um, Just like a, an amazing orator, right? Tom, all these other people. So it's like, how did we go from that and people having debates? I mean, they they literally used to play debates like, like music videos back in the day. Yeah. How did we go from that to this? You sound white. So therefore, you're not Black. 
how did how did how did we internalize oh you a nerd so therefore you're not black so are you you you've internalized that to be black means to be intellectually inferior you internalize that and you wearing it like a badge of honor whoo whoo you saying something i don't understand it i don't you understand it and you know what i look at though like like for real because i'm a 90s kid oh shout out to the 90s kid yeah okay i think about like the shows we used to watch back then you feel me like we used to watch a different world one of my favorite shows ever uh the cosby show like all these shows where you saw these intelligent black people mm -hmm. and, and dealing with real issues like the, the a different world will always forever be just timeless to me i watched the whole series i don't watch the first the first season but all the other, once a year once a year i watch that mug and it's like because it's like they talk about real issues in there and you just see these black young black people that are just intelligent and like that that was our tv that was yeah. their tv and now i'm looking at the show and i'm like <laughs> whoa the conditioning i mean i mean oh it's not the same at all it's not the same it's not the it's not the same at all and not and that's the part that that's sad actually um Think a versus speaker is partly a product of me getting tired of but seeing the only representation of black people as reality TV. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You can literally go any day of the week on prime time and find some buffoonery. Absolutely. You know? And yeah. and, and the representation is terrible. Back mm -hmm. compared to, you know, when we grew up and it's just like even if you wanted to see a black comedy, we had like the Parkers. We exactly. had, you know what I'm saying? We we had things of like substance that still showed us exactly. in a positive light. Exactly. The and Jeffersons, now, Hill, rich man, made us build this way up. You feel? We we could go back, and even even in the beginning of reality TV, it wasn't us in a negative light. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Like when you think about, we could talk about Run's house. We could talk about um. What's that one show, Baldwin Hills, where they were showing yeah. the black kids? You know what I'm saying? Like that, like this isn't real, mm -hmm. but we are getting, we are getting shown this quote unquote mirror that's not a, rep a real representation of us or who we are supposed to be. Absolutely. And then we not thinking about it. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? It's so many of our peers that em emulate this and they yes. think that this is what life should be. And in reality, yes. this is not life. And this isn't even happiness. Exactly. To be honest with you, you're chasing an illusion. Exactly. Because you don't want to educate yourself and really think about what it is that's happening. Exactly. Exactly. And when you got teachers that's in these inner cities, that's in predominantly Black schools, telling kids what to think, and I'm only going to tell you so much, and not really truly think, telling them, not really truly teaching them rather how to think how to critically think i'm just telling you uh this xyz christopher columbus discovered america uh da, 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 da. But I'm, I'm not telling you how to how to critically think and so you're just gonna believe whatever i whatever i spit out to you and yeah. then what does that mean when you're watching a depiction of something that's telling you who you are you just gonna internalize it like oh yeah you know what yeah mm -hmm, that's me that is me i do be doing that like no, <laughs> yeah. no like, I just, I just, it's like a whole host of things I feel like that they just throw at the black community to, to shift, to shift our values, to shift the way that we see ourselves, to shift the way that we treat each other. Mm -hmm. You know, my, my mom grew up in, in Forest Point, Price Point, Mississippi, small little place. Um, but like you, if you do something outside, and this was kind of like this when I when I was growing up in the nineties, if you if you was clowning and the neighbor saw you, oh oh you know you getting a whooping because they finna go tell your mom, mm -hmm. you know. But now it's like, now it's like your kid do something, you think you finna go tell their mom, they like, well don't say none of my kid, well it ain't your business what my what my kid go, doing. It's like what, what what how did we get to this point? Yeah, how, how did we get here? I just don't understand. I just don't understand it, and it's yeah. just like. I don't know. I don't know. I would hate to say that we need to be because it's like it's not as if we're in a really collectively as if we're in a really great space, right? 
Like right. we always talk about the black and white wealth gap and, and what that looks like. And it, I mean, it's freaking terrible, right? I, I can't think of the numbers off the top of my head, but it's not great. So collectively, we're not where we should be, where we could be if we actually came together, collaborated and elevated, but that's that's not what we're doing. Yeah. Um, it's just, I, I don't know. I would hate to think that we have to be in some like, super stressful super you know struggle situation like oh i absolutely need to lean on you because xyz you know like how we talk about like back then when it's like we're collectively going through something and we collectively need to pull ourselves out of this so we're gonna build these schools we're gonna teach each other how to read and etc and etc and it's like we still need that though <laughs> like are you and I mean, and I mean, not even to get, not even to get political with it, which is another thing, right? Because it's just like, mm, mm, if you're paying attention politically too, you don't, we don't know where that's going. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It might come to a point where we might actually have to come together yeah. and actually hold ourselves up. We might actually be getting there now where we need to like actually exactly. start considering some of these things. Because if we don't start paying attention to these things, if we don't start taking that accountability, you know what I'm saying? All of these rights and things that we take for granted exactly. could be taken away from us. All okay. because we are so busy, again, chasing illusions and not really trying to critically think it's almost like we're avoidant of the issues mm -hmm. in, instead of you know what I'm saying actually just doing something about it mm -hmm. it's easier to just look if that's what you say cool yeah. if this is oh this is that's what life's supposed to all right cool I'll just do that exactly because it's easier than taking the time to actually try to figure out what's going to work for me and my life and my longevity and my family mm -hmm. et cetera and et cetera and et cetera because Absolutely. I've gotten away with not having to do this for so long, why would I change today? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And you know, sometimes I think and I wonder if it's like a form of learned helplessness. Like, you know, I tried, I tried, nothing happened. Like I always think about like Black Wall Street like here you have this beautiful community that was by black people for black people, FUBU community. <laughs> and, you know, all of a sudden, you know, you got these haters on the outside that just come bomb the whole city. It's yeah. like, you want black people to have your own and you're always saying, well, get your own, build your own, build your own. And, and, and there's so many places like that, but that's just the story that most people are familiar with. And so it's like, you build your, they build their own and then you come and bomb it because I want you to need me. I want you to depend on me and I want you to bring your money and your resources to me. Mm -hmm. I remember when I was reading about when I first learned about Black Wall Street, they said that the dollar circulated the community a hundred times before it went outside of the community. That ain't happening now. No. Not at all. You feel me? As soon as you go to the grocery store, your money gone. Because yeah. you don't own nothing in the community. Which, whew, that's some of, one of the things that I have an issue with. You know, even in small cities like East St. Louis, you know, how it's so easy for people that's not from there, that's not representative of the people that live there to come in, get business loans, open businesses. So, oh, it's people that live here that have, you know, tried to get business loans to open businesses that were unsuccessful. So, I don't know. It's just like, hmm, that's that's an interesting thing right there to, to think about, to consider. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll tell you that doesn't exist, though. Yeah. But, but I, that's all. That's a whole different rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah, that, that's the rabbit hole right there. But I definitely do wonder if it is this form of, you know, learn helplessness, because it's just like so many necessities that could be missing when you're living in poverty. And you might get to a point where it's like, well, you know, if it happened, it happened. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Right. Well, things happen to me. Things don't happen for me. So it is what it is, which is not cool. Like I, I always tell people, I think about like, we have this thing in, in psychology called Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And at the very bottom of the pyramid is, um, it's like your, your basic necessities, your needs, your sleep, your shelter, stuff like that. And it's like, you know, you go up and you get to the, the very top, which is like actual self-actualization when it's like, ooh, you know, I've made it. I've reached a higher level of consciousness. But it's like, when it's so many people that's not getting their basic needs, 
Yep. Where am I going? Yeah. Like you, you up in here trying to teach me about fractions. I didn't eat this morning. Exactly. Like, exactly. So it's just I don't, I don't know. It's like we could talk about that for a while because yeah. It, it it it's almost like the longer that we stay stuck in survival mode, the less time that we have to actually think about the things that will get us out of survival mode. Absolutely. You know, and, and again, like this is why it's important to have conversations like these, because you know what I'm saying? If, if you can only ignore it for so long, mm-hmm. you know, and it, and, it, and it is possible to beat the odds. It is possible to change your way of thinking. It's, it's possible to change your perception. All of these things are possible, but because we live in survival mode for so long, we grew up in survival mode in our communities. You know what I'm saying? Our parents didn't have time to teach us how to deal with the, with our emotions. They were working. Mm-hmm. They may or may not even know how to deal with their own emotions. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. They can't really teach us how to deal with our finances because they ain't really got theirs figured out yet. You know what I'm saying? So we exactly. we don't have the tools. And it's just like, if 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 we don't focus on that cognitive thinking, exactly. who's going to break the cycle? Exactly. You're just going to do what you've been told and showed. That's why I always like to highlight like St. Louis is the sh- Missouri, sorry, the show me state. Mm-hmm. If that ain't the mentality of people from the hood, because they don't believe what they cannot see sometimes. Exactly. 100%. If you don't have the proof, you know what I'm saying? They go off proof. So they say, life happens to me, not mm-hmm. for me. Mm-hmm. Bad things happen. I grew up in these circumstances. Therefore, it is what it is. I got to make the best out of the best out of a bad situation. And I'm going to just do what I do. And it ain't no way out. And that's not true. And I think that's the difference between the people that make it out and they don't come back. It's mm-hmm. just like, that's the secret that nobody's telling. Mm-hmm. It's like it took that cognitive thinking. It took that self-work. It took that changing of my mind frame. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? And, e- you know, even for me, like, when I say I dropped, that's where I was when I dropped out of school, mm-hmm. you know, and it's, it's literally when you decide like, okay, let me, let me change this narrative. And that's when you see progress in your life. You actually have to trust what you don't see. Mm-hmm. You have to question, okay, this is what life was, but can there be more? Mm-hmm. Which, you know, again, that's why we're here is to show like look people beat the odds every day exactly why not you yeah why not you there you you are made of nothing different like you i'm literally saying i came from your thought process we all can understand your thought process and we're trying to introduce you to a new one Mm -hmm. because we get it and you can have more and we deserve more but you have to believe that you deserve more Nobody else can tell you that. Nobody else can tell you that. Nobody else can convince you of that. Mm -hmm. You have to choose it because it's going to take some work, but it's painful. It's absolutely painful. 100%. And you you know what? I found it's hard for, because you're absolutely right in a way in which like the mindset is so hard to shift. Even when, like, there are different researchers that talk about, like, cultural wealth and et cetera. And someone was telling me they was running this study in, you know, a, a urban community, predominantly Black community. And they were trying to get the, the children to talk about their cultural wealth. Like, everything, and, and, and most of my research comes from a strength-based approach. It's not, what are you lacking? It's not deficit. It's like, they're poor. The reading tests are low. X, Y, Z. It's not that. It's what are the strengths and how can we build on that to get you where you need to be? But she was trying to get the kids to talk about their cultural wealth. And they they kind of got, <laughs> they kind of got a little pissed off um, with her. And, you know, it kind of became an issue in the focus group because they 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 couldn't even see their strengths in their community. They couldn't see them. And it's like, what, what you have, you have just because your resources or whatever, whatever the idea that's 
been kind of beat and pinned into your mind of what cultural wealth looked like. Okay, I didn't come from a, fun, a family with money. We're not, we're not like the wealthy community, you know, because, you know, we have this whole black and white, the, the money gap, <laughs> the wealth gap rather. Um, so it's like the things that they, they're, they're not saying them. It's like, no, you're very talented. You're brilliant. What are you talking about? You, 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 I mean, what, I don't even know if music would exist if you wasn't here. You know, you got, you have all these talents. You have all these skills and even in your community, but you can't see them. All you can see is what you don't got because all they talk to you and tell you is what you liking. It's the same in the research, which is why sometimes it, it pee me off sometimes to even read it because it, it just reads like they have this term now called awfulizing, uh, which and what what it basically means is there's going to be a group that whenever you read about them it's going to be in relation to them being like inferior right so they talk about black students being awfulized in the research and and literally every time you read the research it's why are black kids underachieving um you know black kids are this this many years behind their white peers uh black kids aren't this you know, this many behind Asian Americans. It, it, it's like, and, and one of the things that pee me is because a lot of the measurements in education are not formulated with culture in mind. So they're not like culturally sensitive designs or culturally sensitive skills. And so like, you'll see people talk about, oh yeah, the reading achievement is low for um, black students in X and Y and Z. And there was this test that came out God, I forgot when. I know it was in the 90s though. Um, and it was called the acronym is B I T C H. So I'm trying to remember what the words was. It was like black intelligence test of culture homogeneity or something like that. And basically what it did was it basically en encapsulated the language that we we use, right? Like right. the language that black people use in their everyday lives, the language that you would hear. Like if you might not hear the word amalgamation, right? Who who talks like that to you, right? right. Um, but if I'm assessing your ability to read, I don't, you don't need to know the word amalgamation. I want to know if you can read a text, comprehend the text, and then make reasons uh, you know, or some kind of rationale based on some questions after the text. I don't have yeah. to throw those things at you. So Basically, what they did, they gave black students the test and they gave white students the test, and the black students outperformed. Hmm. Outperformed them, and it's like you would have thought that they would have went, hmm, maybe we should consider some of our other assessments, and you know, making them culturally relevant. No, no, they don't. Right, right. And then, as long as that's never the case. When I put the data on the wall, you're gonna always underperform. You're yeah. gonna always underperform. How you asking me about things that I don't even like? Huh, I'm trying to think. It was this. It was a really good one that I I was talking to somebody about. I can't remember. It's basically a word for a boat, but it's a type of boat, right? I I do not remember what it is. I'm gonna call it. I'm gonna call it J spot just because. Instead of word, but it's like how can you ask me a question about J spot in a reading assignment? Like, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't ride boats. I don't go out. Like, it's just like, right. you know, they right. don't consider these things. And so the data always looks like, hmm, what, what is missing? So I don't know. I just, it just seems like, it just seems like a setup sometimes. So, so. Yeah. So is this what uh, a lot of your work is, is asking these questions and trying to get down to to almost like the root, if possible, of like what's going into um, how we're performing when it comes to schools and getting out of them? Yes. A lot of my work looks at, so I do different kind of needs assessments to see where our students feeling supported in the institution, whether that's you know, I've done higher ed work, but even in like the, the K-12 system, where are students feeling supported? And if it's low and if it's lacking here, maybe it's lacking in feedback, maybe it's lacking in resources, then how can you, as an institution, what can you do to support those students' needs? But one of the biggest things is just 
figuring out what factors actually contribute to the success of Black students, right? That that a lot of my work is centered around Black students. And so I may look at um, how does it impact you if you had an older sibling? Did that harm? Did that help or harm you? You know, when you grew up, and for the most part, we'll see, you know, if a person had an older sibling and, you know, their sibling was, you know, at least two, three years older than them, then they may tend to do a little bit better in school because they had someone that was there, like helping them with their homework and et cetera. Uh, it's just a lot of different issues. It's like a lot of different factors that I may look at to see what actually supports these students, these particular students. And sometimes I look at um, students that may be performing a little bit better on an assessment um, versus other students to see what are the differences in these particular students um, and that makes them perform the, the, the way that they do. And how can we take what we know about them and form an intervention to help these students? So for example, I did a study uh, an attribution retraining study and attribution sounds so fancy, but it just means like reasoning. Like how do people attribute or what kind of reason do people attribute to their success or their failure? Um, and so I would have kids that would say, you know, I'm bad at math. I just don't like math. I'm not, I'm just not good at math. And it's like, well, you know, that's an attribution that a, a child is making that is an internal attribution, because I'm saying it is my own ability and it is a stable, a fixed attribution because I'm saying I'm just not good at it. It's not It's not that I need to work more. It's not that I need to study more. It's that I'm not good at it. And so I'm saying when I see the kids, same population and they're doing better, these are kids that are that have internal, it's still me, but external in terms of it's being, it's unstable. I can change it. Like, mm -hmm. you know what? I really don't get this algebra stuff, but I'm going to take another look at the chapter. I'm going to read through it. I'm going to do the homework assignments. I'm going to X, Y, Z. And we see those students perform better. And so one of the things that I did was um, an attribution retraining where we took students through just like a semester long intervention to really get them to think. And so one of the things that you would do is like for math, because that's always the one people are anxious about. Um, you just give them little small successes. You give them opportunities to get problems right. And so maybe in the beginning of the semester, you don't just throw the hard stuff at them, right? Uh, you just, you know, we we walk through some problems. You get to do some problems on your own. You know, you go do the homework. You do it on your own. You you come back, the same kid that's like, I hate math. I hate math. I'm not, I'm just not good at it. Then it's like, well, dang, you know what? I did get a, I did get this homework right. So maybe, maybe I'm not that bad. Maybe I really can't do this, right? So it's just like little things like that instead of just saying, well, you know, Black students tend to underperform on math achievement tests. So that's just what it is, which is how, how a lot of the, the research reads. And they have all their reasons why, because it's low SES, because it's, you know, the school, the teachers are under experience in, in X, Y, Z. So, which is another thing about the teachers because... Some it's some good teachers in the hood, okay. I'm gonna say the hood because really? I came from. Yeah, <laughs> it's a good teachers in the hood. It's um, some good it's, bad ones, yeah. Yeah, it's some bad ones in the. Hood. It's some bad ones too, and it's just like, man, you know. Yeah, yeah. It, it it's such yeah. an interesting thing to think about, and as you were speaking, it almost makes me wonder. Um, because something that always comes back in my mind, even with what I do. Even though I draw, I find myself doing a bunch of math, right? Mm -hmm. I find myself doing a bunch of math and I find it so ironic when um doing something and I actually have to recall something that I learned mm -hmm. in high school, where it's just like, I'm literally doing algebra for my job. Like I am I am mm -hmm. doing, you know what I'm saying? Like I I genuinely have to do geometry if I want to figure this out right now. And it's just like, oh, okay, that paid off. Or even when I'm doing something like uh, typing and it's just like, I could be looking at these keys while I'm trying to do this, but actually I think I want to refer to my skills because that's actually going to make me faster. So that exactly. keyboard in class that I hated actually is doing some good. You know what I'm saying? When I didn't want to do it then, it's actually paying off now, right? And it's something that you 
think about when kids say it all the time where it's just like you get out of school and it's just like well what what did I learn in high school that I'm actually using now right Mm -hmm. and this whole conversation is actually making me wonder it's just like when we go through schools are we focused on the right things Mm -hmm. is it the actual like one plus one is two Mm -hmm. that's important or is it the my ability to figure something out in the Mm -hmm. moment my ability to find a more efficient or faster way Mm -hmm. to do something in life you know what I'm saying like are we focused on the right things when it comes to education and is that what a part of what's hindering us because it's just like we'll get these tests you know we'll get Mm -hmm. these tests and it's it'll it'll be like you said where it's just like you asking me stuff about a yacht and I don't know anything about a yacht but I could tell you the ins and out of my mama's Honda like you know what I'm saying like Mm -hmm. stuff like that and it's just like do we need bigger picture education versus like the all this standard the standardized approach Mm -hmm. that we get that tells us oh you probably not gonna succeed Mm mm-hmm and I think we do because that's just the way the world works right and it's like it's it's mathematicians that can't take a card apart and put it back together and you're a mathematician right so it's like you I, it's like the world is set up to only celebrate certain certain successes over others or certain skills and talents over others and like people have different of uh, like intelligencies for lack of a better word like I remember reading I know I think I was watching a YouTube video and they were talking about how people were it, it was like this tribe they live on the island they're kind of alone by themselves people don't go over there because they will kill oh, them. Yeah. I know what you're talking about. <laughs> I don't remember their names but I know what you're talking about because you will die yeah, yeah they, will, they will get you uh but they was talking about how they make all these tools these these are people that I don't have formal ed- they don't have formal education right right we have our village our village teachers and that's that's how we that's how we that's what we do but they can teach they can make and craft tools right that they use to hunt to you know to just kind of carry out their daily lives to to shoot you you what you all the way out there on a boat and they can you know throw a bow and arrow at you so right. it's like I, it's sometimes i wonder you know sometimes i really wonder about the way the manner in which the education system is set up especially in the united states like one of the things that always was weird to me was the fact that the kids in the united states start getting tested so early it's like oh let's test the kids let's test the kids and it's like others other places like even in japan the kids don't get tested until they're like you know in the fifth or sixth grade or something like that, right? It's it's when they're way older. It's like our kids aren't given the opportunity to just focus on inquiry-based learning, to just focus on getting the foundational conceptual understanding of ladders and words and numbers down. Right. Because as soon as you can, you finna throw a test at them. Yeah. You know? And that's like very early on, kids start taking standardized tests, which I don't necessarily, I don't agree with, because just like we were talking about, just like you said, they don't, it's one way, it's one way, it doesn't encapsulate anyone's culture, you know, it's either you assimilate or you don't assimilate, and that's what it is. I remember there's a report that came out called the Coleman Report, I think it came out in 1966. And they literally administered a test to to black students. To they literally said this in the article that it was a test of assimilation to see how much black kids assimilated into white culture. But then when you was looking at the outcomes of the test, they were reading like like they were achievement scores or like intelligence scores rather. So you're more intelligent when you assimilate to white culture is what, is what they're saying. Yeah, because that's the standard? Because <laughs> that's the standard. Against, right? Because that's the standard. And I was just like, wow. I, I mean, it just, it just, 
and that's 1966 that's that's not that far you know away from us yeah and it's, yeah. it's still basically the case today you know in in a lot of different ways so yeah. i i don't know it just it bothers me and it bothers me when people that look like me hold those attitudes towards people that look like me you know i remember when i was in high school and i was writing a book report on a book that i read and i had the lady the librarian printed and she was reading it i guess on her way to hand it to me and she looked at me and she asked me do you even know what desipate mean because she saw the word on my paper and i'm looking like why would i ask for it i wrote it <laughs> you feel me like so like I'm making out words, but she literally would not leave. Like she literally was looking at me, and then I said, I, I finally said the definition. She handed me the paper and walked off. Did it's like definition, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> like come on, man! Our kids already got to deal with it from the outsiders. You know, not yeah. to say y'all against, but you know, outside of the community. I got to I got to look at you somebody who like I should see as an ally. I got to worry about you too. Yeah. Yeah. That's 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 that's, that's, that's crazy. That's crazy to me. And then we wonder why cuz then it's like you don't know how how a child will internalize that. Like mm -hmm. lucky for me like I was already pretty like built like who I who I am who I am. But mm -hmm. you don't know like when when it's like a younger kid or whoever you making those little those little subtle remarks or like indications that, oh, you shouldn't be smart. You shouldn't yeah. know this word. You shouldn't, you know, you don't know how they internalize that. Then it's like, oh, well, maybe I shouldn't be because I'm acting white. <laughs> because right. black people aren't nerds or, or whatever the case is. It's just, it's, it's disturbing. Yeah, it, it very much, it very much is. It's, it's another thing that, that baffles me. Um, I've said it in an episode. I actually have a um a friend who is a therapist and she said she was hesitant to go to grad school. And she's been on the show before too. I think she's still on the show. She said she was hesitant to go to grad school because of perception. Mm. Because, you know what I'm saying? It's already one thing to get an undergraduate degree. But now I'm going for, you know, people what people gonna think I'm, you know, they already act like I'm better because I got one degree. Now I'm going back for another one. You know what I'm saying? And even like, you know what I'm saying? In certain families, like when you do something like get a doctorate, like, look, I went to college. Undergrad is hard. Grad school is harder. And a doctorate, <laughs> I don't know now. You know what I'm saying? So to be able to call yourself a doctor, I can see why people walk around like, yeah, put some respect on my name because I worked for that. Mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying but we as a community will look at it and be like oh you must think you better than somebody I just don't get it even, even when people go to undergrad they say like I do remember when I was in undergrad <laughs> and one of my cousins said that to me and I, I don't know if she said it jokingly but I told her like hey like don't say that to me because she was like um I don't even know what it was it'd be the dumbest stuff Marissa it'd be like what was it? I'm really trying to remember. It could be me opening a jar, right? And the lid is tight. And I'm like, dang, I can't get this jar open. They're like, you can't get the jar open? You went to college? You should be... What the hell we got to do with it? Like, what? Yeah. You know? And and you don't, they don't think about how that might affect the person. Like, what what is it? And, and how that comes off, you know? Yeah. Like, how how are you perceiving me? You you put me on a pedestal. You do that. You do that. Because yeah. maybe you, you know, for what, for reasons. Right for various Many reasons. reasons, yeah. But that's an issue. That's an issue that we're dealing with in our community, and that might be hindering so many other people. We don't know from actually yeah. going on and pursuing dreams that they that they really have goals that they really have because they don't feel like they're going to be supported by their family, or they feel like their family is going to turn a back on them or treat them differently because now you think you're better than me. Yeah, and that's that's crazy. It is. It is. And I don't mm -hmm. understand. Like, I don't know what kind of practical solutions we could put forth for that for those issues, for those kind of issues. It's like, we got this external situation. All right, we'll deal with y'all. But it's like, we got issues 
right here, like at home that we need to deal with. And I just don't know, like, how do we, how do we get that together? Right. Right. Well, I think the first step is having the conversation mm -hmm. and bringing it to people's attention. You know what I'm saying? It's just like, because it it does have an effect. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? It does have an effect. Like something that I'll say a lot too, is just like, okay, when, where, where I came from, Joni, cracking jokes on people, mm -hmm. it's like, it's the norm. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. you could say something super callous mm -hmm. to somebody. And you know what I'm saying? We just supposed to laugh like it's okay. Yep. And people have been doing this to you since you were a child. Yep. You know what I'm saying? Doing it to you a child. And the expectation is you're supposed to laugh. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if your feelings get hurt. Mm -mm. Have thick skin. Mm -hmm. Just just shrug it off. You know what I'm saying? You you be all right. So no, then, sure. and then we'll say little things like that. Like, who do you think you are? Oh, she yep. did. What's she that? You know what I'm saying? If you come in a family that gossips, you know what I'm saying? Where you hear people talking about other yep. people and they, they saying how they really feel. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? They saying how they really feel. And then you overhear that and then you internalize those thoughts. Mm hmm you know what I'm saying? So it's just like, well, I don't want to do that because I heard how they talked about such and such. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I don't want to do nothing outside the box because they're going to make fun of me or they're going to do this or they're going to do that. And that's another reason, you know what I'm saying? One of the first things that had to change for me when I went to therapy was my inner dialogue. Mm. Because... Mm. You know what I'm saying? We're we we can just get accustomed to talking talking down yeah. on ourselves yes. and not even realize it. It's it's your oh. inner inner dialogue. Yo yo your thoughts in your head could talk to you worse than somebody on the street. Absolutely. And that's another thing that you know what I'm saying. That's another thing that can hold you back. Mm -hmm. But we don't talk about it because mm -hmm. it has become the norm mm -hmm. of people. It really have. And it's like, I I guess I always think like how much of our culture, I always tell somebody, me and my friend, because we go back and forth. And, you know, I, I consider all my brothers and sisters on the diaspora as brothers and sisters. But I, I always wonder, because I tell him, you know, me as a, as a Black American, you know, it's only so many of us, you know, you can't fly us in from nowhere. Like our experiences is, is rooted in being a Black American. Right. Yeah. And and that that's who we are. But it's like how much of our culture has been, you know, bits and pieces of things that we got, kind of took on from 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 way back then. You get me? So yeah. like even with the Joan thing, like, yeah, we Joan, we crack jokes. Everybody crack jokes, you know, here and there. But it's like when you think about people that were, you know, being basically kidnapped, but being sold and, and being on a selling block and people literally, ah, oh, his lips big, yo, yo lips so big, blah, blah, blah. You know, and you, and you think about, it's like, how did this be, how did this get here? How did we get here? Yeah. You know, I remember doing a um a presentation in, in high school. My One of my friends got on me, like, don't be coming from my culture. I'm like, this is my culture too, whatever. Yeah. But um, like the whole thing with, with soul food, right? And I, I love me some good soul food. But it's like when I when I think about the chilling situation, the chitterlings. I hate chillings. <laughs> <laughs> I hate chillings, man. I just spoke something about them. But it was like that's a thing in the culture because when uh, you know the kidnapper, <laughs> I ain't finna cause no master. When the kidnapper, you know, got you know made they whatever they pig or whatever they threw out the straps what they didn't want they threw it out right. and, and my people because they're going to be resourceful given whatever situation that they in did what they had to do with it yeah. to feed themselves and their family one and, of and our strengths came, by the way what, what you say? one of our strengths by the way exactly because we're going to do what it do whether we got the resources or not and yeah. so you know, they did what they had to do, but it's like, now that's the thing. You like, people want, when, when holidays come up, they like, okay, who gonna make the chitlins? And, and, and you know what I find so crazy is like, this was things that people threw out, right? Straps or whatever. And then it's like, now every time black culture takes something, 
is worth something. I don't care. You can keep telling us, y'all, y'all the bottom of the barrel, baby, please. Because when we step up and we, and we it, exactly. So now it's like, oh yeah, now everybody, now, now you, now you get them too. Oh, and then now it's like however much thirty twenty dollars a bucket or however much it is, mm-hmm. and, and that's with anything, anything. That's why it's just like it blows my mind. Wearing that black- up our yeah. <laughs> it blows my mind that it's literally still, you know, black people trapped in this matrix of what society is telling them that they are and who they are. When it's like, you are so brilliant and so beautiful and you just don't understand that anything you put your hands on, mm-hmm. you going to make it golden. Yeah. Anything you do is going to be golden. Yeah. Yeah. Golf, track, all, all the sports, okay? <laughs> all the music. You let me in the door in the entertainment industry, you're going to be in the... So it's just like, you, you see all this, but you don't believe... They got you to a point where you don't even believe your own eyes. That's how they got you. We done had a whole president and everything with no scandals. They got but you. We still waving flags for we ain't even gonna speak on it. You know what I'm saying? But all right. You know what I'm saying? All right. But well, we got the nerve to walk around thinking that we less than, that we not yeah. great. The yeah. nerve, the audacity of us to think that we not great. It's- like it's all in our minds and you know what I'm saying it's just like it's almost like everybody's sitting here waiting on somebody else to do it no it starts with us Mm -hmm. it starts with us it's the reason why they could create an entire black wall street exactly and then threaten society exactly it's the it's the same reason why Martin Luther King had Edward Hoover I mean J. Edgar Hoover spying on him exactly what you up to exactly the black panthers it's a reason it's a reason I don't need to do this with you right now. Because <laughs> you're about to send me off. Oh, like, we gonna go. But, <laughs> it's like, when I think about, like, people, I always check people. Because, like, like, the Black Panthers was so good at what they was doing. Yeah. The government took over your program. The government based a program off what you got going on. Yeah. Like, like what we, what are we talking about? Like, why it, don't you see? Yes, even these gangs that we rep in now originated as programs to help your community. Now they hurting your community. Thank you. Thank you. Be like, your gang was not based off these principles that you repping right now. Thank you. Thank you. That's not what they founded that on. That's so it, true. No. That's so true. It, I have you really about to set me off. We ain't got the time to be going all that. We no. <laughs> it's so true because like gangs was literally created to police the community because police was was brutalizing people, right? Like, yes. you know, like no, we need somebody to police the police. You the Crips and Why? LA. 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 Crips and Bloods in LA where they needed it the most. Exactly. Where Rodney King and everything like that happened. Exactly. But then they let them come out. And sometimes I be I be a little, a little, because we so oh my God. <laughs> so there's the true origins, right? To this stuff. Like even the gangs, right? Like even Larry Hoover, right? Like, even though it was some some situations. <laughs> Larry Hoover organized one of the biggest voter registrations in Chicago when he was out and it's like uh, like so like it was so many black people in the community they got registered to vote and it was like oh what how long what he did what that 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 black man did what right come on you know and been in jail been in jail ever since like it, i think it was happened like in the same year if they didn't get him that year they got him like the next year so it's like they had a real meaning where they was really putting in work for the community. But then, because Hollywood worked hand in hand with the Matrix, then they make these movies and they include these gangs. And then they show you something. They show you what they want you to think it means. They mm-hmm. want you to in, take on these behaviors, right? Right. And it's just like, and they do. They do it though. It's just like, oh my God. Mm-hmm. It, it's just like, Wow. 
conditioning conditioning it and that's I remember arguing with somebody in college in undergrad because I was telling him like no like brainwashing is real and and I think in his mind he was thinking like I don't know what he maybe whatever he saw in a movie like it's some big machine and you go through no it's subtle things honey it's, it's you watching a commercial you know what I mean? Love that chicken from Popeye's. Love that chicken from Popeye's. You just seen it three times. I'm about to go get some chicken from Popeye's. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's that subtle. Mm -hmm. And it's it's things like you watching this movie and it's showing you people that look like you and it's showing you what they're doing in a particular neighborhood. And over and over and over again, once you see that so many times, if you haven't been taught to critically think, if you haven't made it to you know, a point where you have kind of, you know, established kind of a solid identity and who you are, you will take it on. Yeah. Take that on. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Like, people might not think that I'm crazy, but it's just like, even with the media, you have to even be cautious with the media because, Absolutely. you know what I'm saying? You have to, you have to look at the sources of your media because you please refer to the literal definition of propaganda and that's all I'm going to say. Exactly, exactly. They, they, they ain't no reason. They they passed the law for legal propaganda and we, I'm sure they did that for a reason, right? Le they passed the law where they could do that. And my, one of my favorite Malcolm X quotes is about the media and he says something like, you know, the media is one of the most dangerous tools in the world because the media can control the mind of the masses. Mm -hmm. I can literally tell you who you are. anything I want. And, and I used to always wonder, like, if it is a, a drug epidemic or something going on in Cali, like in a small community in Cali, let's say Fresno, right? Because <laughs> who be going to Fresno? Not this way. Right. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't give me Fresno people. But yeah. uh, why would I'll you then? Get you. <laughs> oh, dang, man. I done did it. <laughs> Like, why would you report on this drug academic or this, this, you know, I think it was like kids uh, snorting glue to get high at the time. Why would you report on that? That's happening in Fresno. You're going to report on it in Illinois and Missouri and, and New York and et cetera. What you think going to happen? Kids going to start smelling glue. You just made an epidemic. You, you did it. You, yeah. you, you, leave, you did it. And that's yeah. what they do. I wasn't tripping off no submarine until I kept hearing people talk about it. Exactly. I, was working. I was living life. And then I was just like, hold on, I keep talking about it. What the happened? <laughs> exactly. Because I wasn't talking I was just... about it. And then to find out days later, it's like, hold on, wait, they tried to do a coup in Russia? I missed that. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. We I tell about? you, every... it's so crazy. Every time something like that happens, I'm like, where should I really be looking? Because they yeah. up to they up. I'm like, hold on. Because I didn't know about the submarine thing either until later, much later. And I'm like, billionaires drowning in the ocean on a submarine controlled by a joystick. I'm like, man, what they hide, man? It, it got to be some other stuff going on. Who wrote this, yo? Like, who wrote this? Like, this can't be can't real. Be real. <laughs> But man, we could we could definitely we could chat about the things, but yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, I'm like I said, I'm not gonna take up your whole night because it looked like we could be here all night. Yeah. So, <laughs> so that no, I'm gonna go ahead and wrap this up. I'm gonna go ahead okay. and wrap this up. But I appreciate you coming on today. We had a lot of a lot of interesting dialogue. Like, mm -hmm. man wow <laughs> we can chat we can talk we can yes talk. Sure. yes absolutely and i mean if you want to come back on the show and continue having conversations like this again anytime anytime and it's so funny too because you actually touched on something that's coming out tomorrow and trey uh, you touched on a couple things in a couple episodes actually mm -hmm. like when trey was literally talking we were talking about the health and wellness aspect of oh, nice. yeah. uh, the expo and yeah. talking about how, you know what I'm saying, in our communities, it's just like the, the chitlins, the soul food, the everything like that. And it's just like, you look at soul food is the perfect example, right? Where it's yeah. just like, Big Mama done died, and then you go eat all the food to kill Big Mama. <laughs> and then the movie's over. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. 
and then the movie's over so yeah the I mean these are exact conversations that I like to have because it's, I feel like they're important yeah they I are. Feel like, I feel like they're so important and representation is important and just showing it's more to us it's yes. more to us than what we see yes. and it's people out here that are really doing things and working to make a difference in their communities and those are the people that deserve a platform in my Absolutely. opinion Absolutely. You know, that's what deserves to be highlighted here so mm-hmm. I definitely appreciate your time I appreciate your work your insight your thoughts um all of that so thank you thank you thank you for having me and I agree with you 100% these conversations are extremely important for us in redefining our culture for ourselves yeah yeah we have to take back our culture we have to we have to take back our culture because we are a part of the culture definitely we are the culture you know at the end of the day we we've seen both sides of the culture we are the culture Mm -hmm. So yeah, on that note, do you want to know? Do you want to let people know where to follow me on social media? Yes, you guys can follow me on social media, y'all. I just made a TikTok. I'm a TikTok <laughs> girl now. Um, on TikTok, uh, I think it's that's a shame. I don't even know my name. <laughs> it's P the Learning Doc. Um, also on Twitter, Doctor Precious Hardy. Um, so you can follow me, chat with me. I'm always open to chat and have engaging conversations. So, and also please go miss the business expo, the emerging business expo, November the 4th coming to Bridgeton, Missouri. So just check that out. If you're following me on Facebook, you can follow me on Facebook, Maria P. Hardy Pacino, (laughs) where you'll see all the kind of information related to the business expo. Yeah. I'm super excited for the expo. I'm going to be out there talking to everybody i'm gonna get to i'm gonna get to work the room i'm gonna have some fun i'm gonna, some fun. We gonna learn some things we gonna learn some things we gonna promote some businesses we gonna get the job done i'm super I, dope, 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 dope. super excited all right y'all if y'all looking to follow me on social media you can find me at marissa y17 on instagram marissa the thinker on facebook and youtube and thinker versus speaker on facebook instagram and youtube at Thinking versus speaker. If y'all enjoyed this episode, hopefully you did. Hopefully you liked it just as much as I did. Go ahead and give it a like. You know what I'm saying? Subscribe to the channel. Um, share it with somebody, you know, help it grow, you know. And if you had anything that you want to contribute to the conversation, go ahead and drop it in the comments. You know, if you're listening on one of the streaming platforms, find me, find us over on Facebook. You know, I'll post about the episode. Let's get some dialogue started about what we talked about today. I'd be interested to know what y'all think about some of the things that we talked about and on that note um unless you have anything else for the people we can go ahead and get out of here you got anything else stay tuned in to thinker versus speaker with marissa y'all i appreciate it i appreciate it man thank you for your time i enjoyed the conversation man hopefully you come back you're more than welcome to come back anytime nice perfect all right cool. not a problem have a good evening you too bye all right. Smooth, mate.